Good morning. We thought we'd try something new at the beginning of our service here. Um, take time to uh, just chat with each other. There's, uh, you can sign in if you wouldn't mind logging in and uh, creating a, a, a username for yourself. And then uh, you can just chat back and forth to each other. And uh, if someone you haven't seen in a while, just ask them how they're doing. Or, or tell someone that you've been praying for them. Um, or, or greet everybody in the whole community on that, that's online there. Go ahead and chat with each other. morning. God bless you. Thank you for being here. And may um, you really be inspired this morning to persevere. That's our, we're continuing in that uh, topic. And I want you and your family to uh, sit back, uh, sing, enjoy the worship, and we'll be praying together and going before God. And then just, uh, uh, we need you to, to just focus on what God wants to say to you this morning. So let's do that together. And for the next um, hour or so, let's just connect with God. There is none like you, O oh Lord. You are great, and your name is great in might. The Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. It is He who made the earth by His power, who established the world by His wisdom, and by His understanding stretched out the heavens. When He utters His voice, there is a tumult of waters in the heavens, and He makes the mist rise from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain, and he brings forth wind from his storehouses. He who is the portion of Jacob is the one who formed all things, and Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. To whom will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls each of them forth by name because of his mighty strength and power, not one of them is missing. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. 
Even youths will grow tired and weary, and young men will stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. The Lord's delight is in those who fear him, those who put their hope in his unfailing love. Glorify the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion.
Father, we come to you this morning uh, with heavy hearts for the many needs that we know of in our church family. There are people who are hurting because of the circumstances of COVID, uh, some who have lost loved ones, others who are just overstressed because of the lockdown, the social distancing that we're having to keep, not being able to see family or friends. There are all kinds of things. There, there's there's people who are hurting. Father, we ask you that you minister. There's also a number in our church family who are dealing with various illnesses, cancers and uh, heart conditions and uh, surgeries that are upcoming at the end of this month. And many people who are dealing with different things, uh, people who have, who have broken their limbs and, and are, are, are needing healing. People in every kind of situation just in our small church family. And I pray, Father, that your hand would be extended to them. Your hand of healing, your hand of power would reach down and touch hearts that are hurting because of illness in their body. Oh, Father, you are the one who transforms life. You you take our, our, our cells and our genes and you, you heal things. You, you put them back together if they're messed up. And, and I just pray that you would do that. I ask that you would minister deeply to people who are hurting because of financial needs. God, minister there. Provide for them. Show them miracles of your provision. I pray, God, that you would redeem all that we need redeemed in our lives. You take us places where we can grow pray and ask that we would be found in you. We would be found seeking you. We'd be, we, we would be found desiring your good presence in our lives so that each day when we wake, we would look forward to talking to you. That each evening as we go to sleep, we put our heads in our pillows and, and we would know that we've spent a day honoring you with our lives. Whether Whatever our lives entail, whatever we have done, uh, we know that we would be honoring, we would have honored you. 
privilege of, of knowing you as our Father, as our God, who is our healer, our provider, our restorer, the one who is our banner that goes before us when the enemy is attacking us. Oh, we, 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 we thank you so much for the privilege of knowing you in these ways. Move in our lives to change us, to make us whole, to draw us closer to you. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. For the last few weeks, we've looked at some reasons why we should persevere. Um, not just because we're going through a challenging time with COVID and the lockdown, and, and that's true, but, all, but because we are commanded to persevere in Scripture, no matter what we are in, no matter what situation we are, are enduring. Right now, we're all having to live through COVID virus or, or the COVID restrictions. Um, it affects all of us in some way, many different ways, of course. But we all need to persevere so that we do not lose our hope, our health, or our faith. Today I want to look at another reason why we must persevere, but just as I did last week, I want to recap uh, just the, the, now it's six different reasons that we have from Scripture why we must persevere. Uh, first, we looked at persevering being the chief way that we resist the devil. Then we looked at, uh, at it as perseverance was essential for growing Christian character in our lives. And Third, we looked at perseverance as a way that others are drawn towards God. Fourth, we looked at persevering to see that it helps us finish well. Uh, when we persevere, it inspires others to persevere. Through persevering, we obtain answers to our prayers and experience fruitfulness in the lives. These are the first six that we talked about. Today, I'm going to look at another reason why we should persevere. And it's because we need to endure to the end. That's where we are saved. The life of Job in the Old Testament is the best example we have of this. You could read his whole story, uh, the 42 chapters of the book of Job. It just, it's in the Old Testament, right before the Psalms. You could read through it, and um, if, if you want the short version, just read chapters 1, chapters 2, and then chapter 42. You see that it starts good, it goes really bad, and then it ends really well. Well, let's look at the beginning of the story. Okay, Job chapter 1 verses 1 to 3. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. He had seven daughters, uh, sorry, he had seven sons. He had seven sons and three daughters. And he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys and had a large number of servants and hired ranchers. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. So the next few verses describe the, um, the plot of the story here. Is one day Satan goes before God, and, and God asks him if he has seen Job, a blameless, upright man who fears God and shuns evil. Satan retorts that the only reason that Job has any integrity was because God has blessed him so abundantly. So he asserted to God that if these blessings were removed, Job would not maintain his God-fearing behavior. So God, confident, granted Satan permission to assault Job with a barrage of disasters or tests calculated to, to see if Job's integrity was true and if he would remain loyal to God. In the first series of tests Satan attempted, uh, Job lost all 
his possessions. And tragically, he lost his sons and his daughters. Let's read this from Job chapter 1, verses 13 through 19. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabians attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword and I'm the only one who's escaped to tell you. While he was speaking, the Bible goes on to say, another messenger came and said, fire from God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the Chaldeans formed raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put your servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at their oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead. And I'm the only one who's escaped to tell you. This story is is the classic, so you think you have it bad story. Job and his wife just lost everything. How, How does one even stand up after this kind of news? One after another, messengers came bearing bad news. Oxen and donkeys, sheep and shepherds, camel and herdsmen. Your sons and daughters. There really are no words. It must have been devastating for Job and his wife. This summer on July 21st, I remember vividly the phone call I received from my older sister. As she began to talk, her cautious voice led Lydia and I to think something was wrong. Then she explained that my dad was on his way to the hospital, but that he passed away in the ambulance. My heart sank. About a month later, mid-August, My sister phoned again, informing me that my mother was rushed to the Montreal Heart Institute with a a racing heart. And before she got the words out of her mouth that that my mom was okay, but she was undergoing a heart procedure at 91 years old, uh, my, uh, my heart, my spirit, just weakened. After I hung up the phone, I turned to Lydia and said, I'm not ready for another funeral. She can't die. I had a month between phone calls. I couldn't stand under the thought of my mother passing. And so many of you have had similar experiences, uh, and maybe not even with the second call being a better one. Uh, Maybe you had two tragic calls, one after another. The dust was still settling from the desert sands from that first messenger who came and walked into Job's house to tell him about the oxen and the donkey that were stolen. When the second came telling him of the disaster that would befell the sheep and the shepherds. A month didn't last. A week didn't last. A day hadn't even passed, not even one hour between messengers. And again, the dust was still settling after the second messenger had come when the third one had broken news to Job that his camels were carried off and his ranchers were killed. If Job felt anything at all, he must have been numb. 
But it wasn't over because the door swung open again and the fourth messenger came in, no doubt out of breath. Perhaps he didn't even know that there were three in who came in before him. He came to tell Job of another tragic event. Many of you would remember the news stories of the oil executives in Alberta who took their own lives in the early 1980s. When the, the 1970s oil boom out west busted, people just could not handle the material losses that they had incurred with that bust. Job's losses were not just all his possessions, but that last messenger came and told him of the collapse of his son's house and the death of all his children. Now, the Bible doesn't say this, but but I could imagine some of them might have been married, and Job lost in-laws as well, and maybe even grandchildren died that day. What, What do you do? How do you feel? Can you even feel? Can you cry? I think my heart would have disintegrated in my chest and I would have gone into cardiac arrest. Like I need a commercial break right now, even just from telling this story of, of loss. Yet look at Job's response to these attacks by Satan. Job chapter 1, verses 20 to 22. At this, Job, up, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. And these were uh, uh, traditional ways to mourn in the Old Testament. And then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Whoa. Upon his return to the courts of heaven, God asked Satan if he had noticed that Job had maintained his integrity through those tests that Satan brought. And Satan wasn't happy with Job's response because this is what, um, what Satan says to God. He says, skin for skin, a man will give all he has for his own life, but now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones and he will surely curse you to your face, Satan attested. But God was confident, however, in who... Job was, blameless, upright, one who feared God and and one who shunned evil. So he permitted Satan to test Job some more, but up to the point of death, he could not take Job's life. So Satan went out and inflicted Job with painful sores. Verses 7 and 8 say, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. Like, I don't even have the strength to keep telling the story anymore. Now Job has all these painful sores. Maybe it was shingles. And and those of you who've suffered with shingles would know partly what Job was going through because not only was his pain physical, but remember he had just lost all his wealth and family. How does one stand up? How does one persevere? Story goes on. Enter the villain in the story. Not really, but Job's wife comes in. At least we think of her as a villain sometimes um, because she broke. She threw in the towel, saying in verse 9, Are you still holding to your integrity, Job? Curse God and die. But how many of us would have been like her? I think more than we're willing to admit. Just look around you. 
What has Satan taken from you that has pushed you to the brink of giving up? Why am I even speaking? Why, was God, why has God impressed upon my heart to speak about perseverance? Because many of us and people in the community are, are at that place. It might be subtle in some ways. We don't see it visibly uh, like we see Job's case, but many are hurting. Right now, many are hurting from the effects of COVID-19. If not the disease, if not having lost loved ones, the lockdown for sure. I constantly hear it from different people. They've reached their limits. Hypocritical politicians. People who don't care. Some just can't handle any more. If that's you, I hear you. Hold on. Please persevere. See, Job goes on to show us how important perseverance is at times of great distress. Look at the next verses. Job, somehow, somehow, he stood to his feet, or maybe he just sat there in the ashes that he was in, and he said this to his wife. You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Job wasn't saying this to her because she was a woman or because she was weaker than him or because she was his wife and he, you know, he, he had enough. I like the way the Living Bible Translation words it. It says... Job said, you talk like some heathen woman. Job was basically saying, have you lost your faith? Are you, uh, you are talking like someone who doesn't even know God. He said, your attitude and your words sound like you've lost your faith. Don't give up. He wasn't rebuking her or yelling at her or getting mad at her. The Bible says this. He said, which in the original language means he said. He was, Job was trying to help his wife see that Satan was getting the better of her. That he was defeating her. You know, Job's faith had been tested. And it was found to be genuine. Many, like Job's wife, leave God when the blessings of God are removed. And Satan was counting on that with Job. What they show is that they love God, or sorry, they loved God for his blessing, not for who he is. They love the blessing, not the one who blesses. Peter summed it up like this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. In this you greatly rejoice, now though for a little while you may have had to suffer griefs in all kinds of trials. These come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Not everyone who starts out on the narrow road of the Christian life finishes. It's not the ones who set out and get saved who are saved, but the ones who get saved and endure to the end. While we, in our temporal state, emphasize the start, the Bible emphasizes the completion. Listen to what Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 10, verses 21 to 22. A brother will betray brother to death. A father his child. Children rebel against their parents and have, and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. 
He said it in Luke as well. Um, differently, in chapter 21, verses 16 to 19, he said, You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to your death. All men will hate you because of me, but not a hair on your head will perish. Get this. By standing firm, you will gain life. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 7, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. We're not talking about sinless perfection here. What perseverance means is that no matter how often you fail, no matter what happens in your life, you don't give up on following Jesus. Proverbs 24 verse 16 says this, For though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. But the wicked are brought down by calamity. Notice the verse says, a righteous person falls. It doesn't say that, uh, you know, a wicked person falls, but it says a a righteous person falls, and he doesn't stay down. He gets back up again. He doesn't give up on his trust in God. He doesn't give up on his faith. That's perseverance at work and we are called to persevere until we die Hebrews 12 verse 4 in your struggle against sin you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood and we read the verses before this verses 1 to 3 last week but in verse 2 the writer of Hebrews had just told them fix your eyes on Jesus who for the joy set before him endured the cross scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God and he said that to encourage us to do the same persevere because that's how we endure to the end and that's how we are saved We are living through a challenging time. You know, one day you'll be able to tell your kids and your grandkids what it was like from your perspective. And some of your kids and grandkids are living through it now, um, but they might be too young to even understand. But one day, I'm sure you'll be laughing about it with them, telling them the stories of the lockdowns. You'll be able to tell them what you did to persevere and to endure. Your testimony of being blameless, upright, of fearing God and shunning evil might be the story that they need to inspire their faith to persevere. Because remember what Jesus said in Luke 21, 19. And I like the way the New Living Translation puts it. By standing firm, you will win your souls. This week in our application, our our, our listening time, I'm going to ask you to do something on your own. I'm going to ask you to do it uh, this week or, or maybe even later today you can do this. I want you to pray a simple prayer asking God to help you persevere through this challenging time. Because you want to be like Job. You want to be said to be blameless, upright, God-fearing and shunning, and a person who shuns evil. You want that set of you. You aren't doing that to gain eternal life. But you know what? You, If you live like Job, you will persevere to the end, and you will gain eternal life. That's the promise of God for those who persevere. Father, I thank you that we're given these fantastic stories 
um, almost seems surreal, too, too unimaginable for us to even comprehend how a man lost so much. But, but I thank you that you give us these stories to, to teach us we must persevere. We must endure to the end because that is when we are saved. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Challenge you again to say that little prayer this week. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for being with us today. If this is your first time, please let us know. Drop us a line at that email address you see on your screen. Back in October, we asked you all uh, if you were interested in being a part of a small group. If you responded positively, we, um, you, you could leave this video now and you can just sign in to that Zoom link we sent you. And we will assemble, myself, Pastor Nathan, everybody will just assemble and we'll be uh, dividing us up into small groups. If you didn't indicate that you wanted to be a part of, but you've thought about it, and maybe you'd like to be a part of small groups, send us an email. Send me an email uh, this week, and uh, we will be sure to include you for next week.